So hello, everyone. I'm sure quite a few of you are familiar with me now. As, as Andrew says, I've done a little bit of a kind of series. Um, so tonight we're going to be looking at kind of communication tips um, in relation to mental health patients, people that you might work with. And I sort of, I, I chewed this one over really, thinking about how I structure it. And I, I felt that we couldn't really do a one size fits all. So how I've broken it down, um, is we're going to look at sort of communication tips that might be applicable working with people with different diagnoses, different disorders. Um, we'll pull it all together with some kind of underpinning theory about therapeutic relationships. Um, and we'll look at, again, just briefly, kind of against some of those kind of myths and anxieties that people have around perhaps communicating with people who disclose suicidal thoughts. Um, again, you know, I'm not going to go on uh, for, for ages with this, because I think a lot of you are familiar with me, but I'm currently a senior lecturer in mental health nursing um, and an advanced uh, nurse practitioner, uh, independent prescriber. Um, I also do a little bit of expert witness work as well in kind of civil liability cases. Um, and I've been an RMN for 10 years now, kind of registered. So my background really is in liaison psychiatry, uh, later life psychiatry and crisis resolution. So I think I've got a good range of talking to people across the spectrum of, of psychiatry, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's going to be a little bit of overlap depending on the situation. Um, don't take these tips in a silo. You know, people can be depressed and psychotic. People can be psychotic and distressed. Um, but we're going to kind of pull all that together with just some top tips, really. Um, I like to make these sessions practical for you. Um, I'm going to assume that most people on this call um, are non-mental health practitioners, um, because I, I'm just assuming that that's the audience that would go for this kind of title. Uh, but of course, I saw from the chat that we've got mental health students and HCAs, which is, you know, absolutely wonderful. And I, I think I just wanted to preface this really by saying, you know, at the risk of doing myself out of a job, you all have the skills that you need to communicate with people with mental health disorders. You know, every single person on this call is in some way linked to healthcare. Something has drawn you into this profession, this field that you want to work with people, you want to communicate. So don't discount those kind of soft skills that you've already got. I think there is a bit of anxiety about, you know, mental health patients, etc. But at the end of the day, these are people with emotions, with goals, with desires, with expectations. And if you think about the patient group that you predominantly work with, you know, all conflict in healthcare really comes from a result of unclear communication, you know, promising things that you can't. geared up for people who are able to go to site um, there's not a huge amount of extra services that would go to someone's home you know we, we get it often that people who are depressed need therapy but there's no in-home provision for therapy you'd only be seen at home by a mental health nurse if you were really really poorly and that's about safety rather than therapy so i don't know are there ways that your services could be reconfigured virtually by telephone to reach out and break down that barrier if someone's really depressed and can't get out you know, we need to still encourage that access to healthcare. Just some simple do's, you know, again, you will all have these skills. It's just maybe helpful to reflect on them. Be patient, offer in, in, encouragement, you know, be positive. If someone's made a small gain, you know, really kind of you want to big that up. You know, I know that must be hard for you, but you've actually done really well to make it to clinic today. Um, you know, ask if there's anything you can do to help instead of asking what's wrong, you know, because it might not be something wrong that that person can identify, but offering a practical solution um, is far more important, far more powerful. Four, seven. Um, ensure that the person knows how to access support if things deteriorate, um, you know, so whether that's a local crisis number, Samaritans, uh, going to the GP sooner. Um, think as well, you know, a lot of suicidal thoughts 
don't come necessarily from a mental health disorder you know quite often we would get referrals oh you know this person they're depressed they're suicidal why is that well they've got cancer and they're they're in a lot of pain and we would you know push back on that slightly and say well look we are not the pain experts could you perhaps do a pain review and then if that problem still there of course will come but you know it's very difficult to do a meaningful psychiatric assessment on someone who is in pain that's uncontrolled so think about your remit is there anything that you can do to address and perhaps psychiatry can work in parallel to that um, I think a good good practice for any service or individual develop a signposting kit uh, that's relevant to you. I know we get international audiences on here, so it will vary. Um, but in the UK, we've got the Samaritans, a great resource. <coughs> you know, people can phone up anonymously, get support, um, talk through things. It's very much a listening service. Uh, but for more formal support, we've got GP, advanced practice for medication. Uh, we've got IAPT for therapy, that's improving access to psychological therapy. Um, so if I were you, if you're in Surrey, Wales, whatever, just Google uh, Wales IAPT and you can see your local service. And quite often people can self-refer. So they might say, well, look, I'm not interested in pills, but maybe a bit of counselling will do me good. A lot of people just feel validated if you can offer them something. And if that's a number, a piece of paper, it's a bit of a psychological trick, really. You know, you might not have actually done something for that person yourself, but you give them a piece of paper. There's a transaction in that, you know, not dissimilar to giving someone a prescription. They felt like they've been listened to. They felt like they've got something out of that. Uh, do check with your local mental health trust. So here in Manchester, we've got GMMH and Pennine Care, uh, both of which operate a crisis line. Uh, these often act as a single point of access. So the benefit to this over something like Samaritans is if you were to phone in crisis, look, I'm, I'm feeling suicidal. If you're dialing into a mental health trust, they can then convert that into service provision. So they could say, look, you're clearly struggling. Let's get you an appointment with us. So if it's more something that we're worried about, that can be helpful because it can convert into to action, intervention, treatment. Um, think about, you know. these or if we're not working on these our communication is going to be poor now you can apply all those tips that i've given you but if you're not kind of applying yourself um as that kind of resource you are the most valuable tool in healthcare you know it's not about the tests it's not about the lab results it's us we drive healthcare you know people don't remember the blood tests or those results they remember how the results are conveyed communicated and I think these are some reflective questions that I would ask you to look at. You know, are you aware of your moods as you're having them? Has some negative language about patients crept in? Are you reflective? Are you able to manage your kind of emotions? Do you feel a bit, little bit burnt out? Like I said at the start, I think the fact that you're all here on this call before the weekend, you, you're not probably going to be that kind of burnt out staff member but I'm sure you've worked with colleagues who are but think about your rapport developing skills are you a bit of a robot or do you kind of have that warmth that empathy that interaction do you avoid conflict or difficult conversations and does your work environment cause negative emotions you know I think healthcare is such a stressful environment we are all at risk of burnout you know we've got high caseloads the NHS is on its knees patients can be demanding we've got difficult managers and all of these can make us grumpy irritable and I think what we want to avoid is a situation where actually we are so fed up and disillusioned that the patients start to become an inconvenience or annoyance. And I think if you are in a bad place, you can't give 100%. So think about support. You know, you wouldn't do surgery with a rusty blade. And I don't think we should be given health care or mental health support when we are kind of knackered and done in ourselves. 
to think about your supervision, think about having fun with your family, your friends. You know, there's more to life than work. And if you're not fulfilled outside of work, I don't think we can give our best. So little pep talk there. I can see some emojis coming in. So I hope I've kind of 